Now, I never like to explain the idea behind a painting, at least not too much in depth. It's like explaining the ending of a film to someone. Any piece of art requires the audience to explore it and come to their own conclusions. This way, they can also come back to it year after year and see it with new eyes. If all is told, then the audience is passive and excluded from the intended interaction. But for the sake of this tutorial, in a context of teaching, I'm willing to share some of the conceptual pathways that led me here. As you will have seen from my sketchbook tutorial, I spend much of my time drawing in museums, and especially subjects in relation with ancient cultures. A particular fascination was with Japanese traditions through their design and painting. In traditional Japanese landscape painting, I found myself drawn to the unconventional format that seemed designed to take the viewer's eye on a very different journey than in Western art. I already was familiar with the horizontal panoramic, but what was intrinsically Japanese was the vertical format. I found this an interesting inclusion of the larger visual effect. It was a different level of immersion within the picture. It includes the three elements of conventional space, foreground, middle ground, and background. I found this vertical panoramic more interesting than the horizontal ones because it allowed you to look from your feet all the way through to the horizon and up to the sky. Unlike the horizontal panoramic, the vertical one took me through an open door, leading me out and into this painted world. It felt much more immersive. And so I tried it myself, with local landscapes in the Alps that lend themselves to tall formats. And I even tried it with a still life, which I treated a little bit like a landscape, because I tilted the view downwards towards the floor. When it comes to the idea, it all started with a feather. Much of the concept behind the feather had to do with one's inner state reflected by the exterior appearance. Now, where did this idea come from? Well, based loosely on the expression, the eyes are the window to the soul, I asked myself, what if the eye was instead a wing? And instead of a soul, we spoke about the inner state of one's mind. Now, it's clear that in the natural world, animals who do not present a healthy outer appearance reveal a, an unhealthy inner state too. In birds, this is even more crucial, as their very plumage determines whether they can survive at all. If they can't fly, they can't seek shelter, they can't feed. So what if a wing could be a window into the soul, and a figure's wing represents their inner state of mind? Now the white feather represents change, and the change can be interpreted in two ways. Either this is a black wing turning white, or a white wing turning black. In any case, the single feather represents the beginning or the end of a transformation. Or simply represents what Yin and Yang proposes, that a balance of contrasts exists in everything. I didn't just sit down and think, right, I'm going to create a new painting with some symbolism. Rather, this whole process happened over several years. This painting is the product of absorbing information over a period of time, letting my imagination play around with ideas without any deliberate searching for one idea. This was not a time of YouTube, Instagram, and algorithms deciding what you should look at next. This was from my own life, my own interests, my own search. Not just waiting for things to pop up on my screen. There was no screen. A book on da Vinci called Flight of the Mind describes in part the endless hours that da Vinci spent looking at birds and how he became totally fascinated with flight. The single feather also sparked off the idea of imagining a world where humans had never seen birds and therefore never seen a feather before. What would they think? How could they imagine what it would be for? Would someone guess that it was an animal or a plant? Then came the self-portrait with the wing, exploring the full symbolism of feathers, revealing your own state of being. Here, the idea of a wing transforming into a new color was fleshed out for the very first time, along with the format that leads the eye from one end of the painting to the other. The next chapter seemed like I was going to make a female version with an opposite composition, to be a sort of a twin piece to accompany the first. But instead, it took a different direction. I wanted to tell a visual story, but not in the conventional horizontal format, from side to side. But I wanted the story to happen vertically, 
from my inspiration from Japanese landscapes. And the idea of a doorway leading into a space instead of a window keeping you at a distance. And I wanted it to be life-size too, to maximize the interaction with something having the same proportions as the viewer standing in front of it. My ideas matured over time on the pages of my sketchbooks. And when I was clear with what I wanted, I experimented with color sketches. For the environment around the figure, I was inspired by the exotic, but also the familiar. On a trip to Sri Lanka, I visited an ancient fortress named Sigiriya, built around the year 480 AD, which has some archaic steps carved into the side of the cliffs. Locally, I grew up surrounded by medieval villages and citadels, where I'd been exposed to the same kind of steps. Carved straight out of the rock, this was the look I was going for, and the local village of Entrevaux gave me direct references. The wings are a huge part of this painting too, so I had to get my hands on a bird of prey. My concept for a wing was closer in design to the large vulture or golden eagle shape. I found a taxidermist that had as their largest bird this Bonelli's eagle that had died from natural causes. And from this wing, I adapted these textures onto the design that I previously thought of. The wings and the steps became juxtaposed in such a way that your eye could move across the very long vertical format. So the wings and the steps became a sort of trick to make you travel up and down the painting. So at this point, I had everything I needed, except the most important, the figure. I needed a model and I made a full life-size study and it was essentially a transfer drawing. I didn't need a high level of modeling, but it did require all my attention of the design of the interlocking shapes. Much of this process was good practice to get ready for the painting, specifically the part where I had to walk so much. With a sight size setup, this distance I had to stand back after every brushstroke was at least six meters, about 20 feet. The transfer process was tricky as I had to make sure the figure would fit just right for the wings and the steps to fit in. So I made several sketches with measurements to ensure where the figure had to go and to know how big my canvas had to be. With a special custom made set of stretchers, I needed to get this right before I ordered them. The level of detail in the painting was not highly polished and from close up, it can seem a bit rough and overly colorful. But I needed the painting to appear harmonious from a distance because I needed the impression to be working from a distance so that the whole image could be within your visual field to help the viewer have an immersive experience. So as we've seen, the process is a complex one, drawing from inspiration from all sorts of places and using various references to help build a believable scene. It takes a lot of preparation, but it also takes time for ideas to mature. And sometimes several paintings lead you to it. I especially want to point out that you don't have to force anything, nor do you have to have the whole idea already prepared. Your imagination needs time. And sometimes a big idea can come from just one single object.